One of the early party leaders who adopted this strategy was John Slidell, the leader of the political organization known as the Ring within the Democratic Party in New Orleans. Slidell's efforts quickly yielded results, seen in electoral victories and the distribution of patronage jobs. This use of positions to reward party loyalists strengthened and expanded the Ring's influence in political competitions throughout the state. Democratic Party organizations in other major cities such as Kansas City, Chicago, and New York followed this pattern. With the influx of large groups of German, Irish, and Italian immigrants into these cities, the Democratic Party also welcomed them and supported their interests, recognizing their potential voting power. Although the Democratic political machine was more successful in forming such coalitions with immigrants, Republicans also engaged in these activities in certain regions like Buffalo, Philadelphia, and Atlantic City. In the 1880s, when a significant number of Italians arrived in the United States, politicians found substantial advantages in establishing connections with immigrant mafias and leaders of street gangs that operated in Italian neighborhoods. These immigrants proved useful in intimidating opponents, while political leaders rewarded them with patronage jobs and ensured their legal immunity. As a result of these alliances, organized crime became inseparable from organized politics in major cities. In New Orleans at the end of the 19th century, the Ring collaborated with the underground groups of Matranga and Provenzano. This collaboration proved to be highly valuable, as candidates supported by the Ring occasionally won more votes than the total number of registered voters in certain elections. It is believed that the support of the Ring may have played a role in Matranga's evasion of extra-legal anti-mafia executions in 1891 in New Orleans. New York Tammany Hall, the Democratic organization based in New York, had working relationships with many underground figures, including gangsters from the Five Points gang such as Paolo Vaccarelli, Frank Costello, and Ciro Terranova. Vaccarelli, who started his career in the early 1900s and controlled street gangs in Manhattan, had significant influence in labor unions on the Lower East Side and aligned himself with Tammany Hall. Costello had relationships with politicians Jimmy Hines and Albert Marinelli, benefiting both parties. Chicago The Democratic leaders in Chicago, such as Mike McDonald, Michael Kenna, and John Coughlin, established connections with Mafia bosses Antonio D'Andera and Mile Merlo, as well as Jim Colosimo, the owner of brothels and nightclubs. Kenna and Coughlin were among the ten prominent figures in the city who carried Colosimo's coffin during his funeral in 1920. Members of Congress, judges, state and federal prosecutors, and local politicians also stood in line with the coffin. Kansas City The Kansas City Democratic Organization, known as the Pendergast Machine, included several notable gamblers and leaders of Italian groups. Johnny Lazia and Charles Binaggio were particularly important among them. Lazia organized and led gambling operations in Kansas City and, in the 1920s and early 1930s, organized bootlegging activities. He was a close associate of Tom Pendergast, the leader of the organization. Lazia was killed in a shooting on June 10, 1934. Binaggio became a successor to the Pendergast machine and took over Lazia's duties. He and his trusted assistant, Charlie Gargata, were assassinated in a Democratic Party club on April 5, 1950. Early Mafia Organizations In the early 20th century, 
street gangs in cities regularly organized flashy dance ceremonies known as rackets. The first underground racketeers were likely members of gangs who forced shop owners to purchase tickets for these events. Gradually, the term racket became a more general term, and in the mid-1920s, many organized criminals referred to themselves as racketeers. Black Hand One common crime among Italian-American communities was the Black Hand Letters. These were written requests sent to merchants, threatening harm to their property or even worse if they didn't comply. These letters were filled with menacing symbols, and some were signed with ink-stained handprints. While some recipients ignored these demands with impunity, others were victims of bombings, kidnappings, and even murders. It is believed that the fledgling mafia organization in New Orleans was behind these forms of extortion. Around 1890, the Provenzano family published threatening letters claiming they were sent by the rival group Matranga. It is speculated that Big Jim, the leader of Chicago's criminals who also had political connections, received similar threats from the Black Hand. Lottery One of the most profitable money-making schemes of the Mafia, heavily guarded, was the lottery. Underground organizations throughout the country were involved in this type of illegal gambling. Participants placed bets on multi-digit numbers with modest amounts of money, and the person with the winning number received a substantial cash prize. Jayasu Gallucci, an investor with political connections and a supporter of Sicilian and Italian street gangs in East Harlem, New York, successfully protected his underground gambling business, the numbers racket, for years. On May 17, 1915, members of rival gangs set a trap on East 109th Street and fatally shot his son. The Mafia infiltrated the labor movement at docks and bustling warehouses, extorting shipping companies and collecting kickbacks from immigrant workers. The New Orleans-based Provenzano gang had a hand in this enterprise. Santo Oteri, a pioneer in maritime cargo transportation, fell victim to this scheme in 1881. When he had a shipment of bananas on his ship, he realized the dock workers, controlled by Provenzano, were unwilling to unload it. Oteri was forced to give a significant portion of his cargo to Provenzano-affiliated fruit vendors to get the dock workers back to work. It is said that Benjamin Siegel, a longtime associate of Charlie Luciano, once comforted someone with the notion that we only killed each other. However, this statement was far from true. The assassinations of David Hennessy, the New Orleans police chief, in 1890, and Joseph Petrosino, a New York police inspector, during his mission in Sicily in 1909, were among the earliest instances of organized crime targeting law enforcement. During the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in 1929, Capone's gunmen killed two individuals who were not members of Moran's gang target. John May was an auto mechanic, and Reinhard Schwimmer was an optometrist going to examine a patient. In 1922, after an unsuccessful attempt to assassinate one of the mob leaders, gunmen realized they were blocked by striking workers and fired upon them, injuring six and killing one. Two others were injured in the chaos of the frightened crowd. Prominent Families Giuseppe Morlo, suspected of the murder of police officer Giovanni Vella and counterfeiting Italian money, fled his hometown of Corleone, Sicily to America in the 1890s. He and his extended family lived and worked in Louisiana and Texas for a while before deciding to settle in New York City. There, Morlo utilized his connections with mafia organizations in New Orleans, Chicago, Buffalo, and New York, to become the main leader of the nascent American Mafia. Morlo set up his headquarters in a busy, 
predominantly Sicilian neighborhood at the intersection of Elizabeth and Prince Streets in Manhattan. He also established his power in the more northern neighborhood of East Harlem. His nephew Vincent and brother Nicholas led a violent street gang in that area, working in allegiance with the Mafia. Morlo acquired support from his distant relatives, the Catania, Lima, Lomont, and Ignazio Lupo, the husband of his sister. Lupo, an immigrant from Corleone, had fled Italy after brutally killing a shopkeeper and escaping the clutches of Italian police. He arrived in New York in the late 1890s and collaborated with Morlo in various illicit activities, including extortion from Black Hand operations. These two became relatives when Lupo married Marlo's sister in December 1903. Underground punishments posed a deterrent for investigators. Gang members knew that revealing any of Morlo's activities would result in their deaths. The Sack murder in 1902 served as an example of intimidating punishment. Several teenagers from Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, who were swimming in the waters of New York Harbor on July 23rd, stumbled upon a large sack in a grassy patch near the shoreline. Inside the bag, they discovered the murdered body of Giuseppe Catania, who had been missing for two days. Catania's throat had been slit with a knife, and his head was almost severed from his body. Law enforcement authorities realized that the motive for the killing was Catania's habit of discussing his underground connections with his friends when he drank with them. It was discovered that Lupo had met with Catania on the same day he had gone missing. However, there was no other evidence linking Lupo to the murder, and no one was ever prosecuted. A year later, Morlo became suspicious that Giuseppe de Prima, an insignificant prisoner, had provided secret information to the police. As de Prima was incarcerated and out of the reach of the Mafia, Morlo targeted Benedetto Madonia, de Prima's closest relative who lived in Buffalo. They found Madonia's body in a barrel on one of the sidewalks in Manhattan. The police couldn't build a case against the leaders of the criminal gangs, and later, several individuals suspected of having information regarding the barrel murder were killed. Business Failures Morlo and Lupo, in the construction industry, established a cooperative company called Ignitz Florio Cooperative Association among Corleonesi. They sold their shares, bought lands in New York City, and entered into contracts with builders. They seemingly took out thousands of dollars in loans for construction and apartment financing. In 1907, Morlo suddenly resigned from the cooperative's presidency. Shortly after, he went bankrupt, leaving behind substantial debts. Immediately following this incident, two grocery stores associated with Lupo also went bankrupt. Lupo's importing company on Mott Street was closed, accumulating debts of around $100,000. Salvatore Manzella's grocery store on Elizabeth Street also went bankrupt and it was initially speculated that Lupo's extortion activities had caused these problems. Investigators discovered that thousands of dollars worth of goods had disappeared right before these bankruptcies. The Italian Squad After a series of bombings in Italian neighborhoods in early 1905, William McAdoo, the chief of police of New York, formed a group of five Italian-speaking inspectors. The command of this new Italian squad was entrusted to Inspector Joseph Petrosino. Petrosino, who had been a police officer since 1883, became the first Italian-born detective in the New York Police Department in 1895. The Italian squad was relentless in its efforts against the Black Hand Gang and other criminals in Italian neighborhoods. A year later, Theodore Bingham, the new police commissioner, 
recognized the value of this squad and expanded its membership. Petrosino's newly formed Italian squad consisted of 25 members under his direct command and 10 members stationed in the Brooklyn office, under the command of Sergeant Antonio Vacris. Petrosino and his team achieved consecutive successes in important cases. In 1907, they arrested Enrico Alfano, the leader of the underground Neapolitan Mafia in New York. Alfano was extradited to Italy, where he was wanted for the murder of Gennaro and Maria Quacolo. In 1908, Petrosino successfully convinced Rafael Palazzolo, the alleged assassin of Emanuele Notar Bartolo, an Italian politician and banker, to refrain from traveling to New York and to return to Italy from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Martyr of Law Enforcement Bingham gathered intelligence on Italian criminals who had come to America. In February 1909, he sent Petrosino to Italy. The mission was supposed to be confidential, and Petrosino boarded the ship under the alias Guglielmo di Simone. However, even before Petrosino set foot in Italy, Bingham had informed the New York media about this mission. On March 12th, 1909, after meeting with officials and contacting undercover informants, Petrosino had a late lunch at Café Oredo in Palermo, Sicily, and then walked to Garibaldi Garden in Piazza Marina. As the unarmed 48-year-old inspector stood next to the garden's fence, he was shot three times and died on the spot. Although there were numerous windows overlooking the Piazza Marina, the police did not find anyone who witnessed the assassination scene. Disbandment of the squad Everyone assumed Antonio Vacris would replace Petrosino in the Italian unit of the New York Police Department. Right after Petrosino's assassination, Vacris arrested several crime and mafia figures in Brooklyn and accused them of knowing about the recent murder of a famous detective. These individuals were quickly released. Vacris traveled to Italy to retrieve Petrosino's documents and investigate his murder, but his trip remained inconclusive due to political issues back in America. Theodore Bingham was removed from his position as police commissioner, and William Baker became his successor, showing little interest in Petrosino and Vacris missions. He ignored Vacris' 742 criminal activity records brought from Italy. The Italian squad was disbanded, and the inspectors were scattered across various regional police departments in New York. Vacris resigned from the police department in 1919 and opened a private detective agency. Revival Detective Michael Fiaschetti a former student of Petrosino, revived the Italian squad for a brief period from 1918 to 1922. This time, the squad was formed in response to the sudden rise in Black Hand criminal activities. Fiaschetti was appointed as the commander of 150 men, but this effort faced difficulties from the start, as many people questioned why the police department was singling out Italian crimes. Fiaschetti shared the same toughness and influential presence as his mentor. However, he lacked Petrosino's selfless loyalty to his superiors. Fiaschetti was arrogant. Despite some notable victories in the fight against the Italian Mafia in New York, Fiaschetti displeased his superiors. In 1922, after a heated verbal altercation with an influential politician, he was physically removed from the Italian squad. Almost immediately, the Italian squad was disbanded, and Fiaschetti's rank was reduced to patrol officer. Counterfeiting Money The United States Secret Service had been aware that the Morla Lupo organization was involved in counterfeiting money. While agents were able to build convincing cases against lower-ranking members distributing counterfeit bills on the streets, 
finding evidence against the top leaders proved difficult. William Flynn, the head of a regional undercover police office in New York, in May 1909, became aware of the distribution of counterfeit $2 and $5 bills in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, Chicago, and New Orleans. It appeared that all of the bills came from one source. The simultaneous distribution of the bills in major cities indicated a large-scale distribution network. Flynn believed that the Morla Lupo gang was behind these counterfeit bills. He and his team covertly kept an eye on the gang's leaders since the Barrel murder. Flynn was well aware of Morlo's history in counterfeiting his numerous travels to different parts of the country, stopping in every city where counterfeit money had surfaced. He knew that Morlo and Lupo used mechanisms to avoid direct contact with counterfeit money. As previous attempts to put the gang's leaders behind bars had failed, Flynn carefully organized his case before taking any action against them. The undercover police managed to catch a person named Sam Locino, a resident of Pittston, Pennsylvania. Locino had been working with one of Morlo's subordinates Giuseppe Boscarino. Flynn used Locino to send letters requesting samples of the latest counterfeit bills from Morlo. He also coerced Locino to meet Boscarino and negotiate the purchase of counterfeit bills with him. With the assistance of the United States Postal Service, Flynn had several incriminating letters intercepted. Some of these letters contained orders for purchasing counterfeit bills that were sent by mail to Morlo and his associates. The intercepted letters had signed receipts confirming the receipt of the letters, as well as additional signatures from witnesses willing to testify about the identity of the recipients. In this way, Flynn gathered a collection of evidence regarding the counterfeit bill transactions. Traders. On June 4, 1909, Flynn himself led the raid on the suspected counterfeiters in the second floor rooms of a job agency on East 13th Street in New York. They arrested seven individuals. One of them, Vincenzo Battaglia, confessed to being involved in the distribution of counterfeit bills. He admitted that Boscarino and Antonio Secola, Morlo's associates, had forced him to purchase the counterfeit bills at 25% of their face value. A breakthrough in the undercover police case came when Antonio Comito, a printing press owner who claimed he was coerced and threatened by Morello in the counterfeiting operation, agreed to give evidence against the gang's leaders. Comito provided information about the gang's meetings, which Morlo and Lupo also attended. He also revealed that the gang had prior knowledge of the assassination of Joseph Petrosino, a New York police inspector, and celebrated his murder. In November 1909, Flynn's agents arrested 14 individuals involved in counterfeiting money. They separated the suspects into different groups. Morlo, Lupo, and five others were tried on January 26, 1910. Flynn's substantial evidence convinced the jury, which only deliberated for about an hour. On February 19, Judge George W. Ray sentenced the group to a total of 150 years in the Atlanta Federal Prison. Judge Ray sentenced Mafia boss Morlo to 25 years in prison and a hefty fine, effectively removing him from his position as leader of the Sicilian Mafia world in America. After hearing Lupo's criminal history, Judge Ray sentenced him to 30 years in prison and a $1,000 fine. None of their accomplices received less than 12 years in prison. Morlo had a difficult time in prison. After about a year, rumors spread that Morlo wanted to shorten his sentence by providing information about the assassination of Petrosino. 
Newspapers reported that Morlo had met with officials and had divulged information about a conspiracy against the Italian squad leader. However, these claims were never disclosed. Some newspapers suggested that Morlo had a change of heart and refused to sign his statements. Morlo suffered from various physical ailments, including indigestion, chest pain, and poor circulation. The letters sent to him from home were not particularly comforting. In the spring of 1912, the former mafia boss received shocking news. He was informed that his son had been killed in a shooting in East Harlem. Four years later, Nicholas, Morlow's half-brother, was shot dead in a meeting intended to reconcile with Proclin gangsters. With the assistance of influential friends, Morlow obtained a reduced sentence from the president, reducing his punishment to 15 years. Due to good behavior, he was released in March 1920. Lupo, who had been sentenced to 30 years in prison for counterfeiting money, entered the Atlanta Federal Prison in February 1910. He received parole in June 1920, and President Harding also reduced his sentence. Lupo realized that his mafia rivals had sharpened their teeth against him. He managed to outlive most of his enemies. However, in 1936, President Roosevelt concluded that Lupo had violated the terms of his parole. Lupo returned to prison and remained there until 1946. He passed away the following year. Chicago Crime Lord Jim Colosimo, the Chicago Mafia boss, was an immigrant from the Calabria region in southern Italy. In 1902, he married Victoria Moresco, a Chicago brothel owner. This marriage marked the beginning of Colosimo's criminal activities and laid the foundation for his extensive criminal empire. Colosimo took over his wife's business, located in New Brighton at the intersection of Armour and Archer Streets, and expanded his criminal activities over time, establishing multiple brothels and engaging in gambling, nightclubs, and drug dens. Although the Mafia tradition opposed involvement in prostitution, Colosimo, as a non-Sicilian, did not adhere to this tradition. He formed business relationships with the local Mafia, led by Antonio D. Andera and his assistant, Mile Merlo, disregarding traditional Mafia ethics. During this time, Colosimo also formed connections with Democratic Party organizations. His control over criminal activities in Chicago's Levy District granted him significant wealth and influence, enabling him to become a key intermediary between the criminal mafia and political leaders like Michael Kenna and Coughlin. Colosimo's wealth and status within the Chicago Mafia were well known. In 1909, fearing retaliation, Colosimo sought assistance from Johnny Torrio, a tough New York gangster. Torrio, like Colosimo, was born in southern Italy. When he arrived in the Windy City, Torrio became the manager of one of Colosimo's brothels and formed a small gang to oversee Colosimo's numerous illegal businesses. In 1912, Colosimo established a new restaurant called Colosimo's Cafe. Likely, Colosimo's transition from owning brothels to becoming a cafe owner was an attempt to gain legitimacy. Shortly after joining forces with Colosimo, Torrio sent someone named Al Capone to work for him. Capone, an American-born criminal, was notorious for his violent nature, particularly during his time working at Frankie Yale's nightclub in Coney Island. Colosimo, Torrio, and Capone led the non-Sicilian Mafia organization, overseeing its rapid growth in Chicago. With the increasing prominence of Colosimo in the legitimate business world, Johnny Torrio took on a larger role in the criminal empire of Chicago and eventually opened his bar, 
the Four Deuces, a short distance away from Colosimo's cafe. After the murder of Colosimo in 1920, Johnny Torrio took control of Colosimo's business, and it is believed that he, with the help of Al Capone, was responsible for Colosimo's death. Family Revenge During the early years of Prohibition, when the illegal alcohol trade became a lucrative source of income, Colosimo partnered with his longtime companion, Dale Winter, a cabaret singer who worked for him. On the afternoon of May 11th, they asked Colosimo to go to his café. He was supposed to receive a shipment of smuggled whiskey. He arrived there shortly after 4 p.m., talked to some of his employees, and went to the entrance vestibule. Employees heard two loud gunshots and rushed there to find Colosimo's lifeless body on the floor. The police initially suspected his first wife's brothers and took them in for questioning before releasing them. Nevertheless, the list of potential suspects in Colosimo's murder seemed endless. Many people, including business rivals, politicians, and mafia figures, had motives to kill the mafia boss. Although no one was ever convicted of Colosimo's murder, historical evidence points fingers at Johnny Torrio, the man who benefited the most from this incident. Torrio, with the help of Capone, gained complete control over the mafia empire, made significant investments in bootlegging operations, and acquired enough underground power to compete with the established Irish-Jewish and Sicilian factions in Chicago.